Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining today and welcome to our Oregon Business Plan Mid-Year Update Webinar. My name is Scott Bruin and I am Director of Tax, Fiscal and Manufacturing Policy at OBI. Before I introduce our guest, Duncan Weiss, let me mention a few housekeeping items. First, we have scheduled an hour for this webinar. We may not need the full hour, but we have it if we do. Also, there will be a time after Duncan's presentation to ask questions. To do so, please use the Q&A function you should be able to see as an icon at the bottom of your screen. Finally, we are recording this webinar. When it's finished, we'll post it on OBI's website where people can review it at their leisure. Now, let me introduce Duncan. Duncan Weiss has been president of the Oregon Business Council, or OBC, since 1995. OBC is a private, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization whose members are principally chief executives at some of Oregon's largest enterprises. OBC focuses the knowledge and resources of its members on key long range public policy issues facing Oregon, such as economic development, education, healthcare, manufacturing, transportation, and public finance. Over the years, OBC has launched many statewide initiatives, and I know, you've seen, I know you've seen a lot of those, including the Oregon Business Plan, which is in fact the topic today. So with that, let me, let me introduce Duncan, who will give us a mid-year review of the Oregon Business Plan. Duncan, the stage is all yours. Great, thank you so much, Scott. I really appreciate this opportunity. I would just point out at the outset, OBI is our key partner. We work very closely as staff. We just had last week, all the staff, our staffs gathered and again, really appreciate the, the partnership and we work on this business plan together all year round. So I'm gonna bring up a slide deck here. Here we go. And just to make sure, can you see that Scott? Is it popped up all right? Looks great, Duncan. Okay, so here we go. Um, so yes, what I want to do is give you an update on, on what we've been doing this year so far, but I also want to give you a preview of what we're anticipating for next year. But before I do either of those, I just want to give everyone a quick overview of the business plan for those who may be less familiar. Many are, are longtime partners and engaged, but just to remind you what the business plan is, what we do, and uh, then I'll give you the update. And I do hope we'll have time for questions and above all comments. I'd love to get feedback on the priorities we're proposing for the, for the 2023 20, period and beyond. So uh, first about the business plan. Um, this was created, now we're in the 20th year. The summit, will, uh, this will be our 20th summit in December. Um, it's a forum, uh, policy forum to discuss policies that could make a difference for the economic prosperity of our state. Again, it was launched uh, 20 years ago when we had a new governor, we presented an agenda there, and it was such a productive conversation that we've been doing it ever since. Um, it provides, I think, a touchstone for um, state leaders to think about what the key priorities for our state ought to be. Um, and we do this summit, um, update the plan every year in December at the summit, working with a range of partners, but most notably OBI, which has been the core partner, you know, if, in its various um, forms over this 20 year period. So we really appreciate that partnership. Um, we highlight the evolving challenges facing the state and what the opportunities. And again, we come up with a policy agenda to present to our elected officials at all levels, frankly, the, 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 our congressional representatives, the governor, the legislature and local officials. Um, and we present those every December at the, at the summit. Um, every 10 years or so, we update the plan in a pretty fundamental way um, with the idea that we, we pursue a, basically a, a vision and with the update over a 10 year period. So we did that in 2000 and we adjusted our goals a little bit. Um, we continued to have the goal of growing wages. Um, we, at the time it was per capita income, but we have average wage growth. Um, increasing the share of people who are working, looking at, there are a lot of folks who are not in at working who might want to be part of the workforce. So that became a, a bit different goal from the employment growth. Um, we added a wealth growth this time, recognizing that wealth um, is a really important um, ingredient for economic prosperity. And we also, this, this, it, for this period, have focused on economic mobility. That is making sure that all Oregonians, regardless of where they are growing up, their race, ethnicity, location, rural, urban, have an opportunity to, to, to progress. Um, a lot of data suggests that the American dream is fading for lots of folks and we wanna get everybody on the pathway to prosperity. So to achieve those goals, we came up with three imperatives 
that are, we think are really critical for achieving the goals we want for our state. First and foremost is growing the economy. And that's been sort of the bedrock of the business plan from the beginning, um, creating uh, growing good jobs. Um, and closely tied with that goal is education, because we know in an, an advanced economy, the ability to educate and train uh, Oregonians to take those jobs, those well-paying jobs, is really, really critical. So there is one put it, they're really two sides of the same coin. And it's really been in the business plan, um, but we called it out more explicitly as, as one of the two, but one of the three imperatives. And then finally, we added opportunity, um, recognizing that for many Oregonians, for a variety of reasons, they're left behind. And we want to make sure we're taking steps to include everyone. And that we've worked, for example, on poverty reduction over the years, the social safety net needs to be refined and improved. There's a lot we could do there. We need to focus on communities and how you create communities that are really supportive of the, those who live there. There are a lot of issues um, that we can be addressing to ensure that opportunity is widely shared. And so that becomes a third imperative. So as we look at the data, we look at the trends and we look at you know where we are as a state, we then turn to the question of, okay, big picture, this is a nice, these are nice goals, high level vision, we have a lot of details under each of these imperatives about what's involved. But at the end of the day, we've got to take some action. What do we want to work on? What are our priorities? And for this current year, we had six, uh, manufacturing, workforce, broadband, housing, the interstate bridge, and in increasing the earned income tax uptake as a part of the social safety net. We picked those very deliberately. Um, the manufacturing, um, we recognized Oregon is a very strong manufacturing state. The OBI report documented that. I worked very closely with Sandy um, when she was in, in charge of OBI on that report. And then of course, Angela and Scott are carrying it forward. Um, that is an enormous opportunity. We have great strength, but there are many barriers to growing our manufacturing base. So we really wanted to focus on that come back to it. Second is workforce. Um, again, always a big issue, but right now um, with the pandemic and going through it, there's enormous opportunity to rethink how we prepare Oregonians, especially those dislocated in the pandemic to get them into good jobs. Broadband became an apparent priority as we moved into the pandemic. Um, we want to make sure that it's becoming, it becomes accessible and affordable to all. Um, Housing, again, can't go in any corner of the state without hearing about housing. We have very aggressive goals to increase housing supply and reduce the cost of housing. Um, the I-5 bridge is back. Um, it was a big priority in the business plan 10 years ago. We didn't get it done. Um, it now looks, the possibility is here, along with the Rose Quarter and other projects, is a big opportunity um, to, to really get, get that done. And then the earned income tax uptake. Oregon is one of the lowest uptakes for earned income tax credits in the country and we wanted to ensure that those who have the opportunity to get extra dollars as they work you know work out of poverty are taking advantage of the earned income tax credit so those are the priorities that we called out for this year so how are we doing um well first of all I, again in context i want to stress that um, these priorities are part of a 10-year plan. And the idea is that we will carry on and identify additional priorities as we go. So in terms of how we're doing, um, the great news was we had three big priorities under the business plan for the, or for the February session. Future Ready Oregon, the $200 million workforce investment, and that passed. We had a recommendation for funding new programs to help increase um, the uptake on earned income tax credit and child care tax credits, and that passed. And we also had recommendations to reorganize the broadband initiative so that we had a new steering committee that could really focus on strategy in a way that I think can get the biggest bang for the buck on broadband, and that passed. So that was those three were our big priorities under the business plan, and they all got done, and now we can talk, you know, in terms of next step. I would say briefly on future ready we're working very closely with the heck and the governor's office um, to really make sure we've got a great implementation plan this is a very aggressive ambitious program it's going to be a lot of help by the business community to make it work and we are very committed to doing that um, and a lot of work we will continue to do throughout the year and into next year on the earned income tax credit we're, i think that's great news and we're now again helping on implementation um, the Department of, of Human Services is lead on that. 
and we have Ken Thrasher and Sarah Foster are helping on the implementation. And then broadband, Ginny Lang from our team and many others are engaged on, we've got a nice, a really good team to think through uh, the broadband strategy. And I would stress, and I'll come back to this, broadband is more than just the physical infrastructure. It's making sure everyone knows how to access it and use it. Um, we've got to broaden the folks who are actually taking advantage of the broadband opportunity. In manufacturing, there's a lot of work going on, and Scott and I are, and Andrew in our office, we're all joined at the hip on this. There are really, I would say, two, two big strands here. First of all, immediately um, after the summit, we get, went to work on the Semiconductor Competitors Task Force that Senator Wyden and Governor Brown and Maria Pope co-chair with an, just an outstanding group of members, along with a really solid staff team that is developing recommendations to advance this opportunity in, in semiconductor. We think we have $40 billion of investment opportunities in this decade in broadband if we could put the pieces together. And I think we are making significant progress on getting some administrative work done, um, both on workforce, on regulatory streamlining that I think will make a difference. And we're reaching out to the industry and, 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 and doing a lot, a lot of work to, to try to take advantage of the opportunities that that are right at hand. Um, I'll come back to this as we talk in a moment about the broader manufacturing initiative. Um, and then meanwhile, um, OBI and um, Angelo Scott and, and team are working on this on the bus tour to go around the state to highlight the importance of manufacturing to show legislators just how strong we are in manufacturing and to bring the conversation forward about what we need to do to build on our strength here and some of the major changes we need to make. Um, on the I-5 bridge, the good news is I think there's going to be a locally preferred alternative selected fairly soon. And the big um, challenge is, is going to quickly turn to how do we pay for it. And this is a role for OBI, I think, in a very big way. We're going to have to figure out the right funding solution. Oregon is going to need to come up with dollars to fund the bridge. And uh, Washington State has already come up with $1 billion. We believe there are federal dollars that will be available. So fingers crossed, this time the bridge might actually happen. And we're very excited about that. It's a critical choke point on the West Coast. It's a very big deal um, for, for the flow of transportation um, and freight and, and as well as dealing with congestion. So those are the priorities. And that's a quick update on what, we're, what we've been doing. And again, as I mentioned, those are the, what we've called out for, for this year. Now, as we look ahead to 2023, um, it's obviously an election year, and we're going to have a new governor. And for the business plan, what we have found is the, the, when a new governor takes office, it's a particularly opportune time for the business community to come together and make recommendations on priorities. Um, there's a fresh look at the state. There's a fresh opportunity to, to make changes. And so, for example, when we started the business plan in 2022, um, we had a 12-point plan. It was... I remember the day before the summit, it was covered as a uh, editorial page in the Oregonian and Governor Kulingowski, Governor-elect Kulingowski just adopted the plan. And in that first year or two made great progress on a whole range of issues from regulatory streamlining to PERS reform, um, just a whole range of, 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 of items. We had a great checklist and we, we checked them off. Um, similarly, when um, Governor Kitzhaber came in in 2000, um, we had a we had at that point a 10 point plan and again he largely adopted it i mean he obviously had many priorities but we we built those working with him built those priorities into his agenda and made a lot of progress again on everything from education policy to water infrastructure in northeast oregon so again um we called out priorities built, developed them and i think it's a great time so as we look ahead we think there's a similar opportunity whoever the new governor is to come together as a business community and suggest proposals that we think could make a difference and where we can work with the new governor to, to really move our straight forward. So with that in mind, we have come up with a list of 10, five of which we're carrying on from this list because there's more work to be done. We're taking ETIC off because we think we've got it stabilized for now. And then adding some additional proposals that we would look to um, present um, at the summit this year for consideration by the new governor and the new legislature um, as we move into 2023-24 period. Um, and this is the list. And um, 
Again, you can see those in orange are new. Uh, many cases we've been working on them for some time, but these would be distilled and, and with policy recommendations available um, by the end of the year. Um, so that's this is the new list. And again, this is all driving um, towards the, the goals for uh, 2030. And again, as we I should stress that with those goals in mind, we also have measures that we're going to be using to uh, to track how well we're doing and achieving those goals. So that's the list. So again, using our framework again, these would be the priorities that we've got uh, 10 of them um, that we think are really important, really opportune um, to work on as we move into the to the to, to the 23 session and, and beyond. So let me just now briefly talk through each one of these a little bit on the logic of why they were selected and you know what we're actually proposing. Starting with probably the most for the economy a really critically important the manufacturing strategy. In each of these cases we have policy papers that you can read will be we've got one pagers that summarize them but we on our website we're building out recommendations and again by the end of the year working with you we would like to have very well fleshed out proposals and again in all cases we'll be working with partners to to develop these but um we want to have, have, have well fleshed out proposals by the end of the year on manufacturing um we have basically five pillars of the manufacturing strategy um and again we're working very closely with obi on this um, the first is land availability pretty basic but if we want to grow manufacturing you got to have land and right now we're out of it and so we are going to have to deal with the fact that we have a land scarcity and that's a big issue that scott and andrew from our team and many others are working on both for semiconductor but it's much broader than semiconductor in every corner of the state practically where anyone's interested in building you know new manufacturing um, we're having trouble finding the land so that's a big one the second no big surprise regulations and permitting there are a lot of there's a lot of grumpiness about the business climate for manufacturing right now. Um, I would have to say I'm kudos to the governor. She has, um, as part of the semiconductor task force, um, gotten involved in the DEQ regulatory system, which is a big one. And it's not just for semiconductor. There are a number of issues to streamline and simplify. And going to work on that. I my guess is there'll be even those there'll be a lot more to be done by a new governor. And so and again, this is an area where. OBI has just been instrumental in supporting that work. And I'm sure it'll be an area where you all will want to stay and be really leading in this area. S similarly on taxes and incentives, we've been looking at that from the point of view of a semiconductor, but it has broader application. And again, Scott has been great on supporting that work. And again, I think we should have a robust agenda for the next governor and next legislature. On workforce, again, Thanks to Future Ready, there's a lot of focus on manufacturing in the rest of the year. I think we can build out a very strong workforce agenda for manufacturing. But again, I suspect there'll be more to carry on with as we move into, into the, the with the new governor. And I would say workforce covers the whole continuum from, you know, um, technicians, you know, on floor on the floor workers to uh, engineers and more advanced degrees that we need to, to, to really support a robust manufacturing um, ecosystem in Oregon. And then finally, research and development. There is a lot going on in manufacturing. We've got OMIC, which is fantastic, um, as a, and we've got to build on that strength so that we are at the most advanced levels in each of our sectors. There's a lot of innovation in manufacturing, um, and we need to be at the top of our game if we're going to be a successful competitor. I stress manufacturing, we are overweight in manufacturing in Oregon compared to other states, most other states. And um, it's a strength, but if we don't pay attention to this, we aren't gonna be able to build on it. And these are high wage jobs, great opportunities for Oregonians of, you know, who traditionally have been left behind. Um, it's a great opportunity, really instrumental for, for the goals of the Oregon business plan. Obviously, I've already touched on this workforce, the future ready investments, um, both touch on manufacturing, but also healthcare and technology. Um, we are, as I mentioned earlier, working to, to build up the infrastructure for that investment. And that involves building industry consortia to define industry needs, creating new models for education and training to meet those needs, and looking at new pathways to help those who otherwise might not see those opportunities, get them connected. So this, I think, is an enormous opportunity. We'll do more work this year, but again, I'm quite confident the new governor um, and the new legislature will have more opportunity to build on the work that's already begun. 
Um, a new area, it's not new, but one area we'd like to get focused on is post-secondary access. Right now, we cannot guarantee every high school graduate will be able to afford to go on to college or get a career technical degree or an apprenticeship. Um, we need to change that. And that will involve finding a way to expand need-based aid, um, I, arguably tied to progressions in high school, um, creating clear pathways to degrees, especially those involving apprenticeships and career technical opportunities, and then helping navigate those, especially first generation college students who otherwise might not see the opportunity. I think a focused agenda could make a huge difference in addressing some of the mobility gaps in our state and for communities of colors and rural community members um, to really give them better, clear access to the opportunities they may want to take advantage of. So this is a one we're working on. Again, we'll need to, Angela and I have talked a lot about this. Angela, obviously, with her background, is very aware of the higher ed issues. And I hope we can together come up with a way to do this without raising taxes, <laughs> to be clear. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, broadband. Um, we've done a lot of work on broadband. I think have a really good broadband strategy. And as I mentioned earlier, there's money for infrastructure and that's important. And we need to do that, recognizing that the private sector already provides a lot of infrastructure, but there's areas to fill in, especially in rural areas. Um, but we also need to focus on affordability and adoption. Adoption is by far the biggest number. There are a lot of people who could have access to the internet. It's available, but they aren't using it because they don't know how. And we've been working with Comcast and others to really think about what are the strategies to help people learn how to use it um, and, and, and make it accessible for them. If you're a, you know, a low income parent, you may not understand how, why your, your child needs it for school, for example, or you know, why you need it for healthcare access or any number of reasons. We need to help Oregonians understand how to use this incredibly important tool for the 21st century. It will help us in so many ways going forward. On housing, um, we set a goal through the business plan about four years ago. We need to create about 30,000 units per year for the next 20 years to deal with population growth and to deal with the backlog of supply. The legislature has taken a lot of actions already to address this, but this is going to be a critical year where recommendations come forward on how to make those goals stick at the city level. And so the plan is to set goals for individual communities. There's work going on right now in this area and then figure out a series of rewards, penalties, not clear what that looks like um, and regulatory changes to actually encourage success in meeting those goals. We will not have affordability without supply. It's supply and demand. You know, it's sort of like we tend to forget this. If you, know, you want to reduce the, the, the rents or cost of housing, you've got to increase supply. We are not providing enough and we won't solve this problem without that solution. It's fundamentally, it will be a private sector solution in building supply, and we've got to open, you know, find ways to open up the, the, the market to make that happen. So I, I think we can expect a very um, ambitious housing policy agenda next year. And it, by the way, since it could involve LCDC and land use planning could very much potentially tied to some of the manufacturing land use policy. So I would just keep your eye on land use policy in general. I think it's, it's coming um, to focus in, in a couple of important areas as we look to next year. On water, um, again, with the drought, there's Oregon has both you know, huge challenges with water, but also enormous opportunities if we can play our, uh, the water cards correctly. And we have advanced a four-part strategy, and there's a lot of work already underway. But again, for a new governor, there is an opportunity to really rethink water. And we, our recommendation is to, first of all, regionalize our thinking around water, come up with regional water plans that address the economy, habitat, community needs, recognizing every watershed is different, different challenges. Um, we need to get better data by, by region so we understand where we stand, where we are. And then there's a huge need to streamline the water permitting process. Um, they're very slow, cumbersome, can take decades, literally decades to get a decision. And then there are water affordability issues um, at the retail level that we think need to be looked at um, for equity purposes. So those are the agendas. And, and uh, again, I think bringing forth um, some suggestions to the new governor on how to organize for, to really get better focus on water could be a big value um, to, for the state. Um, 
And the other big natural resource issue that we would recommend focusing on is forest health and wildfire prevention. I don't think I have to uh, explain why this is an enormous opportunity or challenge facing our state. And this, the, the Wildfire Council has done a really good job in identifying the, the needs. And you know, in terms of firefighting, there's been some modernization going on, and there's certainly some work to help communities deal with the aftermath of fires and, and, and deal with wildfire protection at the community level. But in the end of the day, the huge issue is thinning. We have a, a forest that are simply overgrown and are powder kegs, and they're mostly federal, and we have got to come up with a strategy to thin the federal forest. So Matt Donegan, who's been our lead, um, uh, chaired the Wildfire Council, we're working with him, and I hope I think by the end of the year, he's working to come up with ideas on how to accelerate dramatically the thinning of federal forests. So I, I think you can anticipate that um, by the end of the year. Um, two more to go here. I know it's a long list, but again, there's a lot to be done in our state. Um, economic development, we are working with a number of partners who all agree we need to rethink the relationships of business Oregon, regional economic development organizations, the university research arms and education, um, as well as the industry sectors, um, so that we can have a much more integrated economic development uh, infrastructure, if you will, to, to focus on what it's going to take to retain, grow, and recruit new companies. And so um, we'll be meeting over the summer with a number of the players, and hope we'll, I hope we will have a, some suggestions for a new governor on, on, on the role of Business Oregon and how to make it most effective in connecting with all its partners and, and for us all in the business community to make sure we have a, a, a really well-organized economic development infrastructure, if you will, for, for moving forward. Finally, last but not least, um, and your chair, Jordan Pape, is our chair for this committee. Um, we have, for a long time, have talked about the need for a 10-year fiscal plan for the state. We tend to fly blind um, in terms of where we're going. We tend to look at two-year budgets without really understanding the underlying cost drivers and what's driving expenditures. A few years ago, we put a 10-year plan and fiscal model together, and we're rebuilding that right now. And again, this will be something we will work very closely with OBI on, but where we can really take a look at what the trends are in revenue, but also expenditures, what the demographics are that affect education spending and corrections and all, all kinds of spending categories, and then identify investments that can make a difference to those lines. So for example, investments that will increase the economic growth of the state so that we have more revenue in the future or investments that reduce the cost, future costs of say corrections or special ed by investing earlier. So we wanna put a model together that if you will, create strategy with the budget, not just spending with the budget so that you can really look ahead and think about what you're doing. And also to compare our you know, employee costs um, with other states so just so we have a robust understanding of the big picture with our budget we're working we've got um, a team working on this and again this will be something we want to work on with with all of you so that's the list um, and it's again a, a big list um, we've got a lot of work going on um, again it would not this will only happen if we work together we are certainly aren't doing all this at OBC OBI is partnering with many of these um, we're bringing in other folks, but we do think by the end of the year, we can have you know, substantive recommendations in each of these areas. And if we pursue them vigorously in 2023, we can make a huge difference in meeting our goals for shared prosperity. So I will stop there and uh, questions, comments, love to have feedback. Yeah, Duncan, that was great. And let me invite uh, viewers that already haven't sent questions to go ahead and send questions, but I've got a few that have come through already. So if you're ready, we've got them for you, Duncan. Are you ready for this? <laughs> I am ready. <laughs> and Scott, was, and Scott feel you... free to add. I will add, Scott can can uh, correct me at any point. So oh, okay. we are, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we're, we're partners. I'm not yes, sure I can so. do that, but no, thanks, Duncan. So one of the questions was, um, and the question was, how would you describe the change in business plan sentiment over the last 20 years? And I think what they're getting at is how would how, how have the priorities of Oregon's elected leaders changed over the last 20 plus years as it relates to the, the core elements within the business plan over that time? So, in other words, you know, what was important then in your mm -hmm. estimation of looking out and what's important now to folks? Well, that's 
so you get me, I get to go down memory lane here. This is fun. Yeah. Well, when the business plan started, I guess I would just say, I think the ebb and flow of Oregon is basically is around recessions or economic growth. Mm -hmm. And I say this a lot. When times are good, we tend not to think about the economy. And it turns out that's actually when you should be thinking the economy, because that's when decisions get made that make a difference during recessions. But so when we started, um, we were in a recession and it was really bad. It was 2000. Um, it was 2002. And the new governor, Governor Kulangowski, was very focused on the economy. And that was the business plan was a job growth, wage growth driven agenda and and just unapologetically. And um, it also had, by the way, recognizing that state government was, you know, with the costs were getting out of control. It had PERS in there. And at the first summit, the governor declared he was going to work on PERS and did. And made, if we had not done those PERS changes in 2020, we would be back in 20, 2002, 2002, if that, there was, that legislature hadn't moved that, that following year in 2003, we would be bankrupt today. There's no question that we, yeah. that, that we tend to forget that those reforms that eliminated tier one and tier two and money match, we would have been bankrupt for sure today. And, 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 and a lot of legislators paid a big price for that. So anyway, it was a period when I would say a lot of interest in working with the business community and um, a lot of um, you know, successes. As we moved, and I mean, I'll just, I'm gonna be very, this is gonna be a high level. As we moved through the, the 2000s, sustainability came up in a very big way during, as the economy came back, we got into a lot of you know, focus on sustainability and got made a lot of headway. And I think Oregon is definitely a state that believes in balancing the economy with quality of life and economic you know, and, and e ecological growth. And so we did a lot of good work there. And I think it's, it's, it's all, that was very good. Um, but then again, as we got towards the end of the decade, the economy crashed again. And so when Governor Kitzhaber came in, it was really back to the economy and a, a 10, you know, 10 point plan to grow jobs. And again, we pursued that. Um, so what happens is when the economy gets better, we tend to focus on other things and tend to pay less attention. And so while I think there is general sort of nodding to the economy, there are a lot of decisions that actually get in the way of economic growth that happen when times are good. And we've had some pretty good times. And so I think there's less focus on some of the fundamentals um, today. Um, as we've looked at it, of course, the whole issue of equity and inclusion has come up more and more. We started the poverty folk conversation in 2010, but throughout the decade, we've learned more as we've looked at the data I just have to say, you know, the American dream that we think of is not as robust as you would hope. I mean, there, if you look at the actual opportunities that young people have to have um, in terms of growing into, you know, if you will, family wage jobs, it is very unbalanced. And so that has been a piece that we've added, and I think quite appropriately to make sure we have inclusion. And that gets into things that, you know, we traditionally haven't gotten into things like how is the social safety net organized and earned income tax credit and things like that, that really can make a difference. So today, I think, um, as priorities have moved into other areas by policymakers, um, in whatever, I think we've kind of lost sight of the importance of a strong growing economy in many respects. And I hope this plan, especially around manufacturing and workforce will really revitalize that conversation. So we can come back again, we value strong quality of life. I think we all do. We value a lot of environmental goals and many other things that we're trying to accomplish. But we've got to keep in mind that in the end of the day, a strong, healthy economy provides the revenue, the jobs, and all the things that Oregon <laughs> needs to achieve everything else we want. So um, we believe strongly in that. Well, here's one that it came in, Duncan, that, that I, I think is kind of related, but I think it's more of a more more related to you. What what do you know now that you wish you had known 20 plus years ago when you when you started all this? Oh, my God, that's uh... <laughs> that's, right. that's a good question. <laughs> that's a great question. I just don't know the answer to it. I, all uh, right. You kind of, um, <laughs> but uh, um, I mean, I guess. Uh, the part that I guess I can't stress enough is partnerships. And I wish we had, I guess what I, I know now is how important it is to build capacity at all levels. And I, I don't think frankly, if, if we're doing it again, I, I, and I still hope we can, can aspire to this, we need relationships 
with the state level, the regional level, it's in the business community, within the business community and education that is just ever tighter so that we clearly are working on the common agenda. And quite frankly, that's just a lot of hard work and a lot of conversations. So for example, the bus tour that we'll be doing this summer, I think is a good example. We need just more of those conversations yeah. where we get to know each other and build the relationships. Um, and I still think there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to get built to really have these robust conversations about the future and what it takes. One of the reasons I'm excited about this economic development conversation is I think it's those relationships that you can build with the organizations that really enable business to flourish and for the state to flourish. Um, we got to know each other. And if we don't, we're likely to vilify each other. So I guess I would just say the big thing I've learned, I wish I'd done differently. And I, I mean, we've done our best, we've done a lot, but I, I don't think we can ever do enough in terms of that relationship building. That relationship, right? that's, that's great. Uh, we had a question come in that says, can you please elaborate on Matt Donegan's plan for federal forest restoration? Um, well, yes, at a high level. I mean, essentially what Matt is trying to think through is what is it going to take to generate the resources and to deal with the environmental issue, permitting issues to accelerate forest thinning. And I, without, I really am not feeling like I can do justice to this conversation right now, but he, that is what he is focused on um, with a lot of folks, um, Carla Chambers on our, our team, and she's on the board of forestry and talking to the, the delegation and others, trying to think through, and he's talking with the federal forest service, trying to figure out what's, what are the barriers that are getting in the way, and there are many, but um, I would just say, from my point, we've been bringing this issue forward for over a decade now. Russ Hoflick at the Nature Conservancy first got us attention to this. The federal forests are a powder keg, and they are, if they burn, they burn really hot, they destroy the ecosystems below them because they're way overgrown. They just aren't, they're not healthy and they're not safe. And there have been ex efforts to thin the forest through these forest collaboratives and they've been good, but they're too small. We've got to figure out how to increase the pace and scale. And if we don't, they'll burn and create a lot of carbon, <laughs> destroy a lot of lives and, uh, you know, it, in communities. And so there needs to be a major step up in federal funding. And so he's trying to think through how to do that in a way that, um, that, that we can get the job done. So. I think just, I guess I'll say is stay tuned and hope yeah, stay tuned. Lots, lots to do. That. Excellent. Um, here's one that came in. How is the business plan adopting to the shrinking long term? So you went quite a bit into uh, not quite a bit, but you went into the kind of the workforce issue mm -hmm. and challenges and what mm -hmm. uh, what we see in the business plan is working on. How would you what are the thoughts around the, the longer term issue? Because there's definitely a short term issue that that may be partial related to the pandemic and other issues. Mm -hmm. But we have a demographic challenge over the long run in that we just we're getting older and yes. you know, we're, you know, more people getting older than coming in and all those sorts of issues. Yeah, uh, well, that's huge. And I thank you for that question, because that is absolutely right. There are two things going on. Boomers are retiring and there is a you know, if you take a look at the demographics, the school age population is flat or possibly even declining over the next 20 years. So there is going to be more challenge on workforce. So. A couple of things I would say about that. First of all, one of the key elements of Future Ready, which I am most excited about, is there is funding to organize industries by sector, by consortium. The, the three sectors that were named are um, manufacturing, healthcare, and then it's not really a sector, it's, it's technology jobs. But, um, and, but the idea is for the sectors to think together about what their long-term needs to look at those demographic trends that you're talking about and to project what their needs are and then engage with educators and others to figure out pathways into the jobs to design the curriculum to think be much more engaged and proactive with education um, to make sure that the right credentials are you know identified and then the right you know curriculum and with potential apprenticeships and work-based learning, all kinds of things to actually get the job done. Um, without active, and I would say, you know, well-funded business engagement on these issues, I don't think we're gonna solve the problem. I just, I mean, because the schools 
we'll all be flying blind. They will come to each one of you individually and try to figure out what's going on. They won't see the big picture. So I'm asking, what we're asking is that industry organize itself to think about what the, what, what the, what the career opportunities are likely to be over the next 10 years. Chances are jobs are gonna change like they've been changing with automation. So we gotta think about what those skill sets are and then communicate back to the education, um, to the education and training systems at all levels, higher ed, community colleges, K-12. I don't think we're gonna get the kind of change we need out of education without that dialogue because a lot of students are, are aimless as they go through, they don't see the opportunities and we're losing far too many um, who just don't see a path to anywhere. And given the demographics, if we don't include every, we don't find a way for every young person to see a path to a good job, um, we're not gonna have enough people and that's gonna be a problem. So um, that's a sort of a long-winded, but again, I think I really appreciate that question because I think we've got to pay attention to demography and the skill sets. Um, and the biggest need I see is I don't like this word because I don't think it's it's fair. I mean, we, we it's it's the non four year degree. We sometimes call it the middle middle wow. level, but I don't really think it. It's the apprenticeship programs. It's the career technical jobs. There is a, there are a ton of really well paying jobs that take skills, but they don't necessarily need a four year degree. And we've got to make sure we're focused on those. Excellent, um, Duncan. That was outstanding, and that was the last question that I see that has come in. So with that, I would say if you have any parting <laughs> words, parting wisdom, uh, you can add the last word here. Well, what I would love for all of you to do is look at this list of 10, if we can get those around, I'll share with Scott. We're gonna have a, 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 a white paper that's gonna come out shortly. I've shared it, the draft with the OBI staff. Um, we'd love to have feedback. I mean, again, I think the opportunity right now is um, where you know, we've got some time take a look at what we've produced so far and i'd love to have recommendations if there are other things that we should put on this list that aren't there that would be great if there are things that we sh you don't think should be on the list that's fine too tell us why um but give us any feedback and things we should be thinking about because again we're going to be working with obi very closely as we put all this together um i'd love to have a really unified picture as we move into the next uh with again this is the governor and new legislative session and and if we can all engage together i just think there's a huge opportunity to make a big difference for our state excellent well duncan weiss president of the oregon business council and great friend of obi and all the work we do together we just want to say thank you for this really appreciate it uh just a reminder to guests and to others this will go on the obi website soon so it will be there in perpetuity so all this wisdom that we've heard from duncan <laughs> we can be able to come back and, and address again so duncan with that i want to thank you i want to thank everybody who has joined and wish everybody a great afternoon Take thanks care. so much thanks everybody Bye -bye.